Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Esme Dyke. I'm a director in training in the HLA lab of the University of Alberta. And it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker of today, which is uh, Dr. Jason Aker. And he's going to talk about cryobiology 101. Dr. Jason Aker is the senior research scientist uh, with the Canadian Blood Services Center for Innovation and a professor in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at the University of Alberta here. He received his uh, Bachelor of Science, Master of Science in Experimental Pathology, PhD in Medical Sciences, and MBA in Technology Commercialization degrees, all from the University of Alberta. So he's uh, really a, an Edmonton guy. His postdoctoral training was completed at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston. And his research focuses on understanding the response of cells and tissues to ex vivo storage and the development of methods for their preservation and use as therapeutic uh, products. Dr. Aker's blood service laboratory has responsibility for developing scientific and te technical evidence to support innovative changes in blood product manufacturing storage and utilization. Dr. Aker is author of more than uh, 160 publications, eight book chapters, and holds 12 patents in the area of self self-preservation and microfabrication. Dr. Aker is the past president of the International Society for Cryobiology and was recently named fellow of the International Society of Cryobiology and will receive the very prestigious Basile J. Louet Medal, I hope I pronounced that correctly, which is the highest honor given by the society. He also recently received, uh, was presented the Killam Annual Professorship of the University of Alberta. Uh, beside all these great achievements, he's also a wonderful collaborator. I can speak from experience. And ever since I've started working with him, uh, my new professional life motto is everybody needs a Jason Aker in their life. Uh, so with that, I would like to give Jason Aker um, uh, the floor and uh, hope you all enjoyed the presentation. Thanks, Esme. What I'd like to do over the next, uh, I guess, half an hour or so is, is provide a very... Um, I guess, basic introduction to the cryosciences, uh, but use a number of examples uh, throughout the presentation, which hopefully will emphasize uh, the points I wanna make as it relates to the need for a better understanding of cryopreservation uh, for cell therapeutics. Uh, this is a, a presentation that I often give uh, at um, other scientific societies where cell therapies is uh, a focus of, of interest, but there's a really a lack of appreciation. So I always start with this slide where it really highlights why we need to cryopreserve or at least have cell preservation technologies in our cell therapy lab. And whether it's collection of cells uh, from animal sources or human sources, there's a procurement process that creates those cells and puts them into cell banks. Many of us in the research world right now use cells as part of our research. We purchase them from companies like ATCC or Lanza or, or the European Blood Bank, or we may have primary cells uh, from patients that we get from our local biorepository. Uh, those cells are cryopreserved uh, at some stage of their, uh, of their storage process. Uh, we use those cells then in tissue engineering applications or cell therapy engineering applications where we're putting them into constructs that may then go into tissue banks. And those cells or tissues are then distributed to hospitals, medical centers, you know, doctor's offices in a variety of different forms uh, for transplantation or transfusion. And throughout all of this, you need to store those cells. And it's really uh, obvious then that, um, oops, for some reason I'm jumping ahead here, um, that cryopreservation or biopreservation comes into this. Now, in cell therapies, cord blood is always is pointed to as, as one of the most successful examples of where we've taken a basic research concept into uh, translated into, into a therapy. Uh, cord uh, hematopoietic progenitor cells or peripheral blood, mono, uh, per peripheral blood stem cells are used extensively uh, in, as a therapy. But if you look at the original research that cryopreserved these, um, particularly the first two uh, gentlemen here, Hal Broxmeyer or Pavel Rubinstein, who published the original method for the cryopreservation of cord, um, you'll see quite simply, if you just look at the conditions in the middle column here, how they were very different in, in terms of how they uh, developed their cryopreservation strategy. Um, Rubenstein uses 10% DMSO with dextran 40, a dump freeze, which is simply placing them in minus 80, storing them, then transferring to liquid nitrogen, eventually thawing them, and, and then doing a single step cryoprotectant removal. Uh, versus uh, Hal Broxmeyer, who uh, worked with a very prominent cryobiology group in Indianapolis uh, to develop a 
the method that they are using clinically, which involves 10% DMSO autologous plasma, again, a dump freeze into minus 80 and then storage into liquid nitrogen, um, but a dropwise addition of CPA. Uh, and then if you look further down, a more modern uh, example is, is the work by Rice. Uh, and again, their methodology there. What I want to highlight, though, is just the results that they report. Uh, and depending on the group and depending on the methodology that they're using, uh, they'll report anything from you know, 35% or even 17% all the way up to 100%. So the question we have is, is why is there variability in the results from these uh, established groups who have, who have published methodologies for the cryopreservation of cord uh, HPCs? And one of the things I, I often hear as a cryobiologist is, well, that's just the way it is, uh, or more confusing, that's patient variability or biological variability, and that's just what we get. Um, and it's very frustrating as a cryobiologist because we know a lot more about how to properly cryopreserve cells that would hopefully uh, deal with this variability. And that's what I want to talk about today. If we look at one source of variability, there's obviously cell-specific um, results to cryopreservation. On the left is a table which shows many different tissue systems and cells that are derived from those tissue systems that are cryopreserved either in 5% DMSO in a media, uh, or in this case, this data comes from a company called BioLife Solutions where they use their cryo store media, uh, or 10% DMSO. And, and if you scan the, the, the table, you can quickly see that there's enormous variability in the numbers. And viability can range from anywhere from 18 to 90%, depending on the cell type and all of this was done using a standard cryopreservation methodology. So it highlights the fact that you're, go you're going to see variability uh, from cell type to cell type. Now this, uh, from a cryobiology perspective, really came to the forefront um, uh, when uh, Jacques Gallopo, who was a Canadian who was involved in a lot of the stem cell development, uh, was doing work with mesenchymal stromal cells uh, and work with, the, uh, with a clinical partner. Um, to develop some of this really raised the question is, is this cryopreservation um, variability that we're seeing responsible for poor clinical trial outcomes? And through a series of, of, of I guess, uh, opinion papers and, and, and research studies, Jacques was very um, effective at showing that yes, one of the failures uh, um, in clinical th trial development is a lack of understanding or consideration of the, the effect that cryopreservation plays in the response of those cells. And, and you need to consider that as you're going from a single cell system or a small volume system in a research lab to a full scale GMP environment where you're actually manufacturing these in large volumes. And, and interesting, I just want to point out uh, on this slide is just the underlined passage. If you go back to read the early work in mesenchymal stromal cell where they talk about scaling from research to clinical scale, this is all they tell you about their cryopreservation process. It was simply MEM with 30% DM, uh, uh, bovine serum with 5% DMSO at minus 80 for 24 hours and transferred to liquid nitrogen for a week. And what you'll see as I go through this presentation is in order to understand what is actually being done in these cell therapy, in the development of these cell therapies, or ultimately in the commercialization and scale up, uh, we need a lot more information if we're actually going to understand what it is they're actually doing. But more importantly, if we're to understand why things actually fail when they do fail. So I'm going to start with a, a sort of a story. Uh, and I'm going to compare two cell types that have been very, basically the hallmarks of, of success in cryopreservation, early success in cryopreservation, and sort of why we, how we got to where we are and what some of the important parameters were. So this work, this was a very, this is a very famous, uh, I guess, pre, uh, figure from work of uh, Peter Mazur. Uh, published in 1963, where he showed how um, the survival rate or the percentage of, of cells actually was in, is influenced by cooling rate, but also by uh, the cell type. I mean, it spurred a lot of uh, early work uh, in the 1960s and 70s around studying the cryo injury or, or why cells uh, fail when we try to cryopreserve them. So just compare and contrast now red cells and oocytes. oocytes. So red cells on the left, um, volume is about 90 femtoliters, surface area is 136 cubic microns. Um, of importance is that red cells are the most successfully um, used cell therapy by a large margin, by orders of magnitude over any other cell therapy on, in the, on the planet. Uh, over 120 million units are transfused each year. Um, the, we do cryopreserve uh, red cells using a 40% glycerol solution. It's, we use slow cooling to minus 80. 
Uh, we thawed in a 37 degree water bath. We use a multi-step um, process to remove the glycerol. And as you'll see uh, throughout this presentation, we're very, very good at this and very successful at cryopreserving red cells. Uh, in contrast, uh, oocytes. Oocyte, this is a human oocyte, um, much larger volume, 3.59 nanoliters, 180 cubic microns. Oh. Uh, keep touching my mouse here, sorry, one sec. Um, but of, of importance from a cryopreservation perspective, more than 2,000 people on this planet have actually spent portions of their, I guess, early development life uh, cryopreserved, and, and the oocytes were cryopreserved. Now, the method used to cryopreserve oocytes is very different than what we use for, for red cells. You know, we use a different cryoprotectant. We use ethylene glycol and sucrose. We use super fast cooling rates, 15,000 degrees per minute. Uh, to liquid nitrogen temperatures, and we warm them extremely fast, 2,000 degrees per minute, uh, and then we use a multi-step process to remove them. So very different strategies to cryopreserving cells. Now, why is that? Why do we have different strategies? Well, it's fundamentally because of how they respond to freezing and, and thawing, and that's why understanding cryobiology is important, because we can then develop these kinds of specialized processes. So if we look at the membrane, which is, tends to be one of the first things we consider when we're looking at cryopreservation of a cell, uh, the structures of a red cell on the a membrane on the left is very different than the complex structure of an oocyte. Uh, on the left, obviously, the red cell has a number of surface antigens, that's our blood group systems, that they're, they're code for transporters and, and membrane receptors. The red cell is highly permeable to things like water and gas and nutrients because of its, its function to carry oxygen from the lungs to the tissues, as well as the ability to squeeze into the capillaries. It has to be very deformable. So very different compared to the structure of an oocyte. Uh, on the right, you see the very complex structure, the multi-layered protection that goes around an oocyte to protect it in its environment in order to actually do what it needs to do. Now, when you we study um, the cryo response of, of a cell, one of the first things we want to understand is how do they respond to changing environments? Because when we cryopreserve cells, we're going to be exposing them to hypertonic solutions uh, during the addition and removal of cryoprotectants or during the freezing process itself, uh, as well as, you know, we're going to have to try to remove those cryoprotectants. So there's going to be movement of, of water and, and, and solute across the membrane. So we want to understand how the, water, the cells actually respond to that. And most cells respond uh, almost as osmometers where they'll shrink and they'll swell and respond to that changing environment. And this is, if you, this is what we look at uh, on, the, on the left when we see water coming into the cells. Uh, the cells will actually, um, uh, in terms of a hypotonic solution, the cells will actually swell. Or the cells will shrink when we actually expose them to a hypertonic solution because water leaves the cells. And we can measure this and we can correlate it to structure and function. Um, and, it's, and what we're interested in is, is the rate at which this actually occurs. So on the left, you see uh, what happens to red cells. And on the right, what you'll see is what the, the osmotic response of an oocyte. Uh, it is temperature dependent, um, and it's um, very much um, uh, an order of magnitude um, slower than we actually see with a, with a red cell. So on the red cell, if you looked at the cells responding within a second, here you're talking about them responding within 30 seconds or a minute. So very different kinetics of their, of their water response. Now, one of my graduate students, Dr. Maria Jarova, developed a methodology for us to study the, the movement of water uh, across the membranes of red cells. The red cells are, are particularly problematic because they have aquaporins, uh, which makes them extremely fast uh, responders to, to uh, anti-isotonic conditions. Uh, so she developed a methodology to use stop flow and, and looking at the autofluorescence of hemoglobin specifically in order for us to track uh, the, the change in, in cell, uh, cell volume. So on the right, you see you know, what happens when you put red cells in a two times sodium uh, chloride solution. You'll see that the cells uh, shrink and, and they shrink rel uh, relatively quickly within um, um, seconds in a lot of cases, depending on temperature. Now we use this technique to study the red cell membrane in detail and in some of the, the factors that come into play when we look at the osmotic response of, of cells. And one of the things we wanted to look at was the effect of temperature, which you see here. Uh, on the in table one on the top left, uh, or as a function of the osmolality uh, that you're sticking the cells into. And this becomes important when we start looking at putting the cells into cryoprotected solutions. And what you see is, is the difference between adult red cells and cord derived red cells or fetal red cells. And on the right hand side, you see the osmotic tolerance uh, of those uh, red cells under different conditions. And all of this data is, is meant to really just tell you that 
the red cells um, are affected by temperature, they're affected by the solution they're put into, and they're also uh, affected by their developmental stage um, and, and where we actually source them from. Now, the other interesting thing that my group has been studying is obviously donor variability uh, through the work at the Canadian Blood Services. And what we did here is we looked at seven day old red cells that were exposed to a hypertonic solution um, at a temperature. And we just looked at different donors. So we tracked the, the, osmo or the water permeability or the L sub P uh, of different donors. And what we find is that, not surprisingly, that there was variability from donor to donor. Um, so we looked at this and, and the run to run variability. So you know, the methodology has some error and it's about 17%. Uh, but the donor to donor variability is extremely high, about 40%. We've since gone to try to understand that run to run variability. And we now know it's because even within a uniform population of something like a red cell, there are older red cells and there are younger red cells and those cells have different permeability characteristics, uh, which affect this run to run variability. Uh, but we uh, most interestingly found that there's donor variability. And some of that donor variability is related to the age of the donor and the sex of the donor. And this is just a graph which shows some work of one of my other master's students uh, who looked at the effect of, of storage age on the permeability characteristics of blood from young females or older male donors uh, and basically showing that there's a difference between them. Now going back to the oocyte, uh, the oocyte, again, has very different permeability characteristics. And this is just work showing that the water permeability characteristics are very different, uh, an order of magnitude um, slower than what we see with red cells, as well as their permeability to, think, to cryoprotectants like ethylene glycol or dimethyl sulfoxide or propylene glycol. Uh, again, the cryoprotected permeability is very different as well. So water and cryoprotectants will move much more slowly through oocyte, uh, um, and it occurs principally by simple diffusion. Now, one of the other questions I always, I always get asked is, is why do we choose certain cryoprotectants? Uh, why do we use DMSO for certain cells and glycerol for others and propylene glycol for others? Uh, and part of this was empirical. Now, this is, it was data based on the discovery of these compounds. The first work in 1949, discovery of glycerol and the protection of spermatozoa. Uh, and then that led to the use of glycerol almost within a couple of years, uh, the first human transplant, transfusion uh, of red cells stored with glycerol. And then uh, a gentleman, um, James uh, Lovelock, who actually then was studying um, cryopreservation, the basic mechanisms of cryopreservation, and was looking at what are the characteristics of a good cryoprotectant, and went through and screened a whole bunch of common uh, chemicals that we might have in a lab and, and discovered or made the accidental discovery about dimethyl sulfoxide. And that has become the principal cryoprotectant that we use in a lot of cell therapies. But always the question is why? And it's not because that's always been used or often I'll hear because, well, that's dimethyl sulfoxide has been grandfathered by the FDA. So that's a reason why we have to use it. Um, there's more, more to it than that. And I'll explain some of the, the reasons why. So one of the things we're concerned about when we cryopreserve uh, cell therapies or cells is how we are adding it and how we're removing it. Now, this is just a representation uh, of, a, of a cell that has certain permeability characteristics to cryop a cryoprotectant uh, with specific water characteristics. And what you'll see on the first half is, is when you expose a cell to a cryoprotected solution, that solution is hypertonic. It's, it's has an osmolality greater than isotonic solutions. But because water and cryoprotectant can cross those membranes, albeit at different rates, the cells will initially shrink as water leaves the cell. But then as the cryoprotectant returns into the cell, the cell volume will go come back to an isotonic volume. Now because permeability is temperature dependent for both cryoprotectant and water, you see curves like you see on the left-hand side of this when you add cryoprotectants is that if you're adding a cryoprotectant at zero degrees, it's going to take you longer to equilibrate that cryoprotectant versus if you add that cryoprotectant at 22 degrees. On the flip side though, uh, when you're trying to now, you've cryopreserved the cells for a decade and you want to transplant them, how do you get that cryoprotectant out? Because if that cryoprotectant is toxic uh, or if it's about such a high concentration that you will need to remove it, in order to avoid things like intravascular hemolysis, um, as we see with cryopreservation of red cells, you have to remove that cryoprotected. Now again, the reverse now occurs, is that now you're gonna be putting those cells into, a, into an isotonic solution, uh, isotonic to what the normal uh, cell um, composition was, and the cell, the cryoprotectants now are going to uh, 
weave and the water is going to weave the cell. But here you're going to see, again, a very different response as you increase the concentration of the crop protector you're using from one to two to three to four molal, the volume excursion is going to be excessive. That water is going to uh, rush into the cell to dilute the cryoprotectant that's there. That's going to cause the cell to swell. But then the cryoprotectant, as the cryoprotectant weaves and the water weaves, the cell volume will come back to isotonic. Now, if you aren't careful and you do that at, at zero degrees, for example, while the permeability of the cryoprotectant is so, is so low relative to the permeability of water that the cells are just gonna to basically uh, lice. They're gonna continue to swell and lice uh, before any cryoprotectant can come in to balance that osmotic uh, uh, force. So the optimum recovery is obviously going to require an understanding of the temperature and the rate at which these cryoprotectants are coming in and out of the cells. Now, the reason why we use cryoprotectants, if, and this is sort of a, a very simple, um, I guess, way of uh, representing it, is that as you increase the concentration of the cryoprotectant, the amount of ice that actually forms is decreased because the cryoprotectant suppresses the freezing point of the solution. So the freezing point suppressed, so at any one temperature, not, there's not as much ice as there would be um, at, if you had a, a lower, uh, lower concentration of cryoprotectant. And think of this as, as the same reason why we add salt to our roads in the winter. We add salt or, or sand to the roads in order to actually uh, um, depress the freezing point so that actually we melt the ice that's actually on our roads so that the roads actually stay clear. And that works really well to about minus 30 and then after that uh, we can no longer add salt to our roads because it's just too cold and, and we can't actually um, suppress that freezing point any further. So this is one of the reasons why. And on the flip side, in terms of the, if you have less ice there, uh, as a result, you'll have less concentration of the solutes in the unfrozen fraction. Uh, as ice freezes, it freezes in a pure form. It, ice, it, it concentrates the solutes in the unfrozen part. So if you have less ice that forms because you're using a higher uh, cryoprotectant, you're gonna have less solutes that, that actually concentrate at any one specific temperature. So increasing the concentration of cryoprotectant reduces the amount of ice that's formed, but it also most importantly reduces the extracellular solute concentration at a given temperature, which plays a very important role in how water is now moving across those, those cells. So the higher concentration typically um, results in less damage during freezing, but that's not, that there's a caveat with that. And obviously it's the toxicity of the cryoprotectant itself. Now there's been some, there's some, uh, a lot of work that's been done to try to understand the differences between permeating cryoprotectants like dimethyl sulfoxide and glycerol and non-permeating or non-penetrating cryoprotectants like HES and dextran. And we use all of those in our cell therapies, um, but we use them in such a way to manage the freezing response um, and at different stages of the freezing process. And this was work that was done out of here at Edmonton uh, by my mentor, Waksu McGann, who really was um, instrumental in helping us understand how those cryoprotectants actually work in order to actually protect cells during freezing. Now there is, as I mentioned, uh, an issue of toxicity. And, and one of the challenges is the cell specific cryoprotectant toxicity. So on the left hand, you actually see uh, one of the challenges with cryopreserving oocytes is if you use a cryoprotectant like dimethyl sulfoxide, um, the dimethyl sulfoxide actually results in, in spindle damage to those developing, to those oocytes, which obviously influences fertilization and, and development. So you can't you tip, use DMSO. On the other side um, is work that was done by James Lovelock looking at red cells, where he actually was looking at using dimethyl sulfoxide for cryopreservation of red cells, but was able to show quite nicely that the uh, red cells, because of its unique membrane composition, uh, the dimethyl sulfoxide actually dissolves the, the lipids of the, member, of the red cell membrane, causing the cells to be damaged. So you can't use dimethyl sulfoxide for red cells, and you can't use uh, DMSO for uh, oocytes. So we use different cryoprotectants. Yet if you ask someone on the street, you know, how do you cryopreserve uh, a cell, they'll say 10% DMSO and one degree per minute. Um, because that's typically what has been propagated in the, in the literature. But here are the two most successful cell types that have been cryopreserved and they don't use dimethyl sulfoxide. So if to summarize sort of our, our, our understanding, this is again is a high level um, sort of, I guess, summary of one um, hypothesis that's been proposed. So when you start with a cell and you cool it, ice will form outside the cells. 
As the ice forms outside the cells, it's going to uh, concentrate the solutes and as a result, water is going to leave the cell in order to balance the concentration on the outside of the cell and on the inside of the cell. Now what happens next is determined by how fast you cool. Now when I say how fast you cool, what I've just been talking about is the fact that every cell type has a different permeability. So when we talk about the rate of cooling, we're not talking about fast relative to some numerical value. We're talking about fast or slow relative to how um, water moves across that membrane or cryoprotectant moves across that membrane. So if you cool slowly uh, or too slow to allow, uh, or to, to allow for that water to leave the cell, uh, to balance the osmotic uh, gradients that develop across the me membrane because of the growing extracellular ice, what will happen is you'll get a concentration of intracellular and extracellular solutes, which can be toxic in themselves, as well as mechanical stress to those cells. If you cool too rapidly, meaning you are cooling faster than water can leave the cell, then there's a probability that uh, the water in the cell will actually supercool below the freezing point and ice will form inside the cell and that will result in, in damage to the cells. So there really is an optimal rate at which you're actually going to be cryopreserving them. And this was proposed by you know, Peter uh, Mazur and his two-factor hypothesis in the 1970s. Um, and on the graph on the bottom is, again, something that we often see. But I want to point out that, again, the cooling rates is related to permeability, not absolute temperature. But also, you know, is that the maximum recovery there that you're going to get is not 100%. And that's because in the absence of cryoprotectants, it, you can't balance any two of these forces to get 100%. So you really do need cryoprotect uh, cryoprotectants to bring you up to 100%. So going back to this um, cooling rate sensitivity curve that I started with, this really summarizes the fact that uh, depending on the permeability characteristics of the cell and the, uh, the source of the cells and the toxicity of the cells, you're going to get different uh, optimal survival as a function of different cooling conditions. One of the other things that becomes so important, particularly as, as we're going into cell therapies, is how do we treat the cells before and how do we treat the cells after the cryopreservation process. The cryopreservation process is just one process in a large um, sequence of events that we are um, doing to these cells, right from collection, maybe to expansion, uh, to then finally cryopreservation, then thawing and then transplant. All of this can influence the characteristics of the cells and as a result, the quality of those cells. Um, and as I've just alluded to, the response of the cells to the freezing response is really dependent on biological factors. So if you do not um, consider uh, what you're doing to these cells when you're developing this, it's really going to be garbage in, it's going to be garbage out. Cryopreservation in itself will not, um, I guess, protect against damage that was done upstream in the process. So you're not going to be able to freeze these things and then hope that uh, you are going to be able to get cells at the end if you haven't taken uh, into consideration what you've done to them. But the other challenge I always put out there to uh, individuals in co with commercial um, cell therapy companies or in, in industry, uh, typically what happens is you develop your cryopreservation process for a process that was developed in research or early development. And then you, as you go through moving it into GMP, you change or evolve your enrichment process, your expansion process, or your isolation process, or your bag configuration, all of your volumes, your cell concentrations, all of the things that we do to bring it to a final product, the last thing that is ever done, and I, I'm still yet to see a company that has done this well, is to go back after and redevelop your cryopreservation protocol for that condition. And it becomes very, very important to do that or else, uh, as we've seen in, in, through history, you get to a point where you have your cell therapy fail in clinical trials, not because the therapy itself is not effective, it's because you failed to actually redevelop your cryopreservation process to demonstrate that you actually have the same product that you had in the earlier stages of your development. Now, one of the other things I just want to talk about because it has such a huge impact on what we do in the cell therapy industry is transient warming. So we're either cryopreserving cells and storing them in liquid nitrogen uh, or restoring them uh, in minus 80, doesn't matter. Um, but throughout the, the processing of, or, or I guess the handling of our, our, of our product, we're going to be taking them out of the, the liquid nitrogen. We're going to be putting them into dry, to maybe into liquid nitrogen shippers. We're going to be packing them and shipping them across to our end users. We're going to be moving them into different temperature environments. 
During, just during routine operations, we're gonna see compressor cycling, filling events in your liquid nitrogen, inventory management. You're opening up your, your system to figure out, okay, do I still have everything I said I have in my inventory? Packing, shipping. Any of us in research know that you, when you go to pull that cell out of uh, liquid nitrogen storage, you pull the rack out, you're searching for that box, you open up the box, you pull out the tube, you close up the box, you put it back in the rack, and you put the rack back into the liquid nitrogen uh, tank chamber. Well, what you haven't realized is that simple act of cycling that temperature is killing your cells. The stability of the, pro of the frozen product is phase state specific. And just because it's frozen, meaning it's below zero, does not mean it's stable. It's stable because of all the things that you've done to cryopreserve it successfully. And then if you introduce these warming events, you're just gonna further kill them. And I'll show an example of that. Um, there wasn't a lot of data on this um, for a number of number of years. There was very little data on this. There was always observations that, you know, yeah, if, if you, Keep them in one free in your one freezer that that doesn't uh, be that isn't opened as much. You get better recovery than the one that seems to be your quarantine freezer, for example, where you're putting stuff in and out all the time. Um, there was some studies that were done, but I think what really has happened is organizations like FACT and, and the accrediting boards have recognized that transient warming is important, and they built into the standards a requirement to demonstrate that any transient warming that occurs during your handling process does not adversely affect your product. And as a result of that, there's some really good data that now is coming out that's showing exactly what the regulatory agencies and all of us in cryobiology were concerned with, is that every time you're transiently warming your samples, you're affecting your quality. And the reason why is, is, is this, it's ice recrystallization. So when you cryopreserve a cell on the left-hand side, you get very, very small ice crystals. And those uh, are unstable, but you stabilize them by storing them at a low temperature like liquid nitrogen temperatures. But if you actually transiently warm those to even minus 20, you're not thawing the sample per se, but you're bringing it up to a higher sub-zero temperature, those ice crystals grow. And they'll grow and they'll continue to grow each cycle that you do. So if you're pulling these racks out of your liquid nitrogen uh, freezer a few times, you're gonna get crystals that look like the ones on the right. Uh, very, very large ice crystals. And this is what they look like inside cells. So what you see here are cells uh, that are labeled uh, with a fluorescent dye on the left-hand side, they're unfrozen. If you cryopreserve them with liquid nitrogen, or with 10% um, DMSO to minus 80, the dark spots you're seeing in the center graph are actually ice crystals. Now, if you transiently warm that from minus 80 to minus 20 and back to minus 80, look what the ice crystals look like inside the cells. Obviously, that's not probably not helpful for the cells, but you haven't thawed these cells. You haven't thawed them and refrozen them. All you've done is simply cycled the temperature. Now, everyone I've talked to says, well, that's really good on the, on the cryo microscope, but it doesn't happen in a vial because the vial is a larger volume. Well, we've measured that. We've shown that a single cryovial, two mil cryovial, will actually go from liquid nitrogen to minus 80 to minus 20 in under 40 seconds. Um, faster depending on you know, the, the volume that you have in there. That means you know, it doesn't take very long for these events to actually be occurring. So when we develop a cryopreservation protocol, these are all the things that we need to consider. We need to consider the rate of cryoprotectant addition, the temperature of the cryoprotectant addition, the temperature of ice nucleation, and I haven't talked about ice nucleation, but that's a critical piece to this. The cooling rate, the storage temperature, the warming rate, the cryoprotectant removal process, the choice of cryoprotectant, the cryoprotectant concentration. All of this needs to be considered, and there's really uh, excellent um, tools that can help determine which of, what um, conditions you need at each of these different steps. But you have to do the work. You have to understand, for example, how a cell responds to osmotically to the different cryoprotectant solutions that you're planning to use, or what's the toxicity of those cells to the cryoprotectant. You know, it's one thing to say that uh, the cells are slow responders, so as a result, I'll just expose them for a longer period of time, but if you happen to have a cell type that you can't expose them to the cryoprotectant for more than 30 seconds, you might be in a problem. So as a result, you may, need, you may be forced to look at other cryoprotectant solutions or different cryopreservation strategies altogether. Now, there are a number of novel technologies coming, and, and the thing that frustrates me as a cryobiologist is that the technologies that are being used in cell therapy right now have not changed since 1953. Um, 
we are now that's when 10% DMSO was used. That's when 1% DMSO or one, one degree per minute was proposed. And we haven't changed yet. The cryosciences have, have, have emerged enormously. Um, so one of the challenges we have uh, is how do we get this technology into the hands of the cell therapy developers? So one of the technologies that my group's working on is in an, uh, full disclosure, uh, I'm involved in a company that's commercializing this, but one of the technologies is small molecule ice recrystallization inhibitors or technologies that can modify the membranes, cholesterol loaded cyclodextrin, for example, that's used extensively in sperm cryopreservation or membrane permeable triolose or non-metabolized glucose. These technologies have been developed to, to deal with the issues of uh, changes to membrane or membrane permeability to cryoprotectants or the effect of ice crystals. So this technology all exists. It's been shown to be extremely um, effective at improving recovery of different cell systems. So I'll talk just briefly about Panthera Cryo Solutions, which is our company. We've developed this technology for use in core blood. We've published on this work, so it is publicly available. Um, and the way it works is, is essentially what we've developed is small molecules that actually have a structure that bind to the surface of ice crystals or restructure the water around the growing ice crystal and prevents that ice crystal from growing. So if you look at uh, simple things like long-term uh, long engraftment function, 10% uh, DMSO versus the two different uh, IRIs that we show here, we've shown that you get significantly better uh, long-term function one of the things we're interested in is engraftment. So if you, if you transplant these uh, cells that have been cryopreserved into a mouse model and you look at time to engraftment, if you're using uh, ice recrystallization inhibitors, not only do you have more cells, uh, but those cells are actually probably of a better quality, which I'll show in just a minute. And as a result, you get better engraftment um, than you would with a standard DMSO-based protocol. And then in multi-lineage studies, we show that we are able to protect all of the lineages uh, equivalent, equivalently with the use of an IRI versus a standard DMSO. But most, you know, I guess, exciting is in, in transplant studies where we've looked at taking uh, IRI-treated um, stem cells from the bone marrow uh, of mice that we've transplanted. We then do a secondary transplant. We should do engraftment. Uh, what we show is that you actually have like, to demonstrate that you get much better uh, and more potent um, number of CD45s and, and CD45, CD19s, or the myeloid pr uh, progenitors. Uh, now, whether this is because you have more clones that are actually survived the cryopreservation process, and as a result, you're getting these, uh, or you're getting better quality, uh, better protection during the cryopreservation process than you would with a standard DMSO solution, still needs to be resolved. One of the other things that uh, technologies has been developed, uh, Dr. Ken Story from the University of, or Sir Carleton University in Ottawa, he's world renowned for his work studying the molecular respo response to cryostresses. And there are organisms in the environment, for example, like tardigrades that completely desiccate, they, they can last decades in a dry form. How do those actually do that? And what is the molecular triggers, molecular adaptations that these organisms have? And can you actually use those to uh, modify the freezing response of cell therapies. Um, number of, of studies in this area, and, and I won't go into a lot of detail here, but a lot of really interesting stuff coming out of it. Uh, you can actually uh, encapsulate cells. If you're interested in further protecting them from the damage of ice, you can look at hydrogel encapsulation. Uh, there's some really cool supermolecular gels that have been developed that are actually temperature sensitive. So you freeze them down, they gel, you thaw them up, they're in a liquid form, so you can process them and they stabilize the cryopreservation process. Some really neat technologies coming in this area. Uh, freezing rates has become very important for cells that are very temperature sensitive, like oocytes or embryos, um, or even tissues where we can get the cryoprotected in, we can um, cryopreserve it, but the challenge is we can't warm that uh, whole organ, for example, or large tissue fast enough to avoid recrystallization and as a result, damage to uh, the tissue and to the organs. So uh, a large number of technologies have been developed on the reproductive side using things like quartz and metal capillaries, uh, or on the organ side, actually moving to microchannel heat exchangers that can give you these super high um, uh, warming rates and allow you to actually achieve uh, cryopre stable cryopreservation and then thawing uh, and maintaining cell function. Uh, technology is being developed in, in uh, Minnesota, looking at nanoparticles where you actually can now uh, coat nano magnetic nanoparticles uh, and add those to cells because they have a magnetic core. You can actually then use microwaves to heat them up so you get super fast 
um, thawing rates and that can actually, again, avoid this damaging recrystallization that occurs. And these have been demonstrated in a number of cell therapy systems. So just to end, I guess, this portion of it, the take home message really is from crowd biology perspective is uh, currently in the cell therapy, everything seems to be focusing on 10% DMSO and one degree per minute or empirical modifications to that without a clear understanding of the cryobiology of the cell system that you're trying to cryopreserve. So be wary of 10% of uh, DMSO and one degree per minute. It, it probably doesn't work for your cell type. Um, you, you know, it's only really effective for a certain number of cell types where you've been able to show really good recovery. Uh, and typically those cells are, are have other characteristics, which you probably don't need the DMSO anyway if you actually modify your cryopreservation process appropriately. So you wouldn't need the 10% DMSO anyway. You wouldn't have to worry about the systematic toxicity of that compound. There are improved methods and methods for assessing in vitro and in vivo product quality, and they're critical throughout this process. So as you're developing your cell therapy, as the regulatory agencies require us, you have to have potency assays. Use those appropriately to, to determine at every stage of your process that your cryopreservation process is doing what you think it's actually doing. Because uh, all too often, uh, either during the initial development or during scale up, we forget to go back and we've tweaked something. Uh, and as a result, we're not actually getting the same product that we were getting in a different stage of development. And there's emerging and exciting uh, technologies that are coming and, and are here that would dramatically improve the recovery of cell therapies if they were to be adopted. And I think what we uh, are unfortunately um, uh, challenged with is that uh, developers of cell therapies spend very little money on the cryopreservation of their product uh, or development of the cryopreservation process because they fall to, into, the, into the, I guess, chasm that 10% DMSO in one degree per minute will do everything. And as a result, they're not actually putting in the time, energy, and resources to move this new technology into uh, their product development process. So... Obviously, I, I don't do all this work myself. I do it with an enormous list of collaborators at both Canadian Blood Services in my lab, the University of Alberta, and collaborators around the world. And I'd just like to end by a plug. Uh, if you are interested in the cryosciences or cryopreservation, the annual cryobiology meeting this year is in San Diego. It will be a focus on cell therapy. If you want to come and see the latest and greatest technologies in the cryosciences, it's July 22nd to 25th. We'd love to see you in San Diego. So I will end, stop there and happy to answer any questions or just talk to the panelists.